All right, awesome, Billy man, I'll pass to you. Why don't you kind of take it away with how you guys pulled in 600K last month and did 26 deals in 30 days. Yeah, last month we had a killer month. Um, we added 605,000 um, to our pipeline um, in revenue for for deals. Um, that was 26 or 20, uh, 27 contracts is what we did. Um, one of the things like I hate, to, like I hate puffery. I hate what I hate about like the wholesale industry is like the the BS that people put out there of how many contracts they do. It's like I'll actually be transparent about that. Like we did 27 contracts and every single person out there has a fallout rate, whether they tell you they do or they don't. Um, I saw someone make a post the other day said, Hey, like we did like, you know, 60 some odd contracts, um, this month, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, damn, like I was like looking up to this guy and I know someone that works in there. I'm like, what do these numbers actually look like? Like, is this, is this real? Is this true? Like what's going on? They're like, we have a 60% fallout rate. And I'm like, gosh, like, that's rough. So, and it, my point behind that is that like, if I could leave anything here on this call that I want you guys to remember is that like, we're in the business of helping sellers, not just making money. Um, I closed a deal this morning that we made $0 on, uh, because I told the seller we would commit to closing it. Actually, I think I've spent $600. Um, I told the seller we'd close it. I gave him my word and did not have the heart to cancel a contract over $600 on them. I lost 600 bucks. I don't care. That'll come back around in good faith and, and help me out in the future. So, um, if, if you guys take anything, like I said, just, if you learn how to help people, you'll go so much further. And if you truly build that rapport with your sellers and care about like the outcome with them, it'll, it'll, it'll do wonders. Um, a deal we contracted last night, um, in Arlington, we were $30,000 less than, another offer they had and they chose to run with us. Um, so just, it's not always about a number with the seller. It really is about trust, rapport and doing what you say you're going to do. Um, which is one of our core values, um, here is that you do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. So when we tell a seller, we're going to close a deal, we do everything we can to close a deal. I'd be lying to you if I told you we didn't cancel contracts, but our termination rate is around a 10%. Um, and if you ask any title office, that is extremely low. Um, and that's us canceling 10% because we're not perfect. We missed the mark on, uh, an ARV or a rehab or the seller just lied to us about what the house actually needed. Um, so we're on a 10% and about another 10 to 15% is because of bad title work. Um, unfortunately we just lost one that I really wanted to develop light industrial on and just had messy title work can't close it. Um, so, um, I don't have a whole, whole lot that I have planned to talk about. I love more of Q and a, um, but I will say that what it takes to get to even your first hundred K month is, is hard to do solo. Um, you can hit the hundred K month solo. There's absolutely no way I'd do 600 grand a month, um, without a team. Um, give you guys a little bit of input, like what my team looks like. I have, um, two lead managers. I have four acquisition managers, two dispo reps. And when I say managers, acquisition agents, reps, they're the guys that close the deals, uh, two dispo reps and one TC. And I have a new one starting next week. And I am also currently looking for another acquisition rep. Um, I made a post this morning. So if anyone knows anyone who wants to be in acquisitions in DFW and you are going to have to be in office or they would have to be in office in Frisco, Texas. Um, we are hiring another person. So, six hundred. What are you? What are your guys? Uh, what do your acquisitions guys make? Um, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I just cut the biggest check to one of my acquisition reps this month, and it was nearly thirty thousand dollars. So, he's also a freaking stud. Um, I've cut a few twenty thousand dollar checks. Um, I'd say on average. Um, our acquisition guys are making on average 10 grand a month. Um, that's what it comes out to. Cool. I just think that helps give people context that they know somebody, a killer that's in, you know, Texas, that's looking for something. Um, yep. you said you'd rather interview Q and a, so I'll just, I'll do it that way. Um, yeah. you mentioned a couple like jobs that just, I want to make sure people know what they are. So 
what is a like what's an inside sales agent or qualifier like what are they doing for you yeah so i'll go through like also i'll, I'll tie in like our process behind this as well so cool. we have uh, like i said our lead managers acquisition managers dispo and then tc uh, of course there's marketing tara runs marketing if you have a marketing question i can answer it at high level um my wife tara she's the uh she hates the word guru but she's the guru there with uh marketing um but essentially a lead comes in and my lead manager receives it a lead manager is the person who um a lot of people use the uh the term qualify the lead i like to say that they find a situation and if you can find and the lead manager is in charge of finding someone in some type of situation that could be they want to downsize, they're behind on their mortgage, they just inherited the house, um, the house needs a lot of work, um, there's a pile of dog shit in the back corner of the house, whatever it is, there's a situation in that house or that property, they pass that lead over to my acquisition reps. The acquisition reps are the ones who are the closers. They know how to negotiate a deal, they underwrite the deal, they make the offer on the deal and they get it under contract contracts. So your acquisition reps are the ones that are more so sales guys on the acquisition side. Then it goes after we get under contract. Um, if I'm not keeping it, because we we do buy you know, from four to six properties a month ourselves. If we're not keeping it, we will then um, have the Dispo team take it and they'll market that property out. So the Dispo team will skip trace buyers in that area. They will, uh, I have an email list of, I don't know, like 80,000 or so emails on there. Um, they'll just blast it out so that it's out there. Um, to me, that's almost more so brand recognition. We hardly ever sell a deal just by emailing it. There is a lot of conversation that goes on. Um, and then after, uh, once it's also under contract from the acquisition team, there's your transaction coordinators. Um, honestly, a TC, if I was looking back, that's a position I wish I would have hired earlier. Um, I feel like I would have had more deals get closed because of bad title work that I was just like, I don't have time to work on this. Um, so I had my TC work on it. And you could find fractional TCs as well, um, meaning like they might work for and they could live in, you know, the middle of nowhere, Indiana, somewhere and still be a good TC for you. Um but the, the, the TC is helping resolve title. They're making sure the earnest money is in from the buyer. Um, they're making sure my earnest money is in because I forget. Um, and they're making and they're helping clear that title, which is the most important piece. Um, after I hired a TC, my fallout rate from title work um, almost cut in half. Uh, that's worth their weight in gold. Um, a TC makes anywhere from 50 to... 80,000 a year if they're depending on what kind of workload they can handle. I'd say 60 is more uh, on par with what they make. Um, but 60 grand for a TC on our deal size of 20K a pop, that's three deals a year they have to save and they pay for themselves. Um, so, like, I think TCs are one of the very undervalued positions in this industry. But if you find a good TC, they, they pay for themselves very, very quickly. Um, and not only that, but we charge a transaction coordinating fee to our end buyers, which also in turn pays for them. So um, the TC though is a, a critical position. I think it's overlooked by a lot of people um, and finding a good one. If, if you're getting into wholesaling um, or if you are wholesaling, you're going to want to have a TC that understands a wholesale transaction and is not just... Um, your typical like agent TC where they're just pushing paper around. Um, they, they are doing that for us. They're sending amendments. They're sending terminations if we have to. They're scheduling buyers and sellers for closing. Uh, my TC right now, we have one that, honest to God, I think it's been an escrow for six months and we're closing it next week. If I had that deal myself, my hands would have been thrown up on it four months ago and said, I'm not touching this. Um, that deal is going to pay us 15 grand and... Um, just, that's just a prime example of why a TC is worth their weight. Like I would have said, I'm not dealing with this. Like it's too much work. It's not worth my time where she's worked on this for months now and we're closing it in a week. And then, I mean, it went from everything from getting a, it was, I think a mobile home converted to real property or put in someone's name first, then converted to real property an affidavit airship on it from a dead person. Like it was a whole bunch of stuff, but 
that's why the TC is a critical piece as well. Um, they are all very, very important pieces, but I think a lot of people hold off on a TC as one of their last hires. When you could hire a TC on like a per transaction basis of like 550 bucks a transaction, um, and they are worth it in my opinion. So yeah, no, that's, that's solid. I mean, I find a lot of guys, the first hire they try to make as an acquisitions person after they've done three deals. And it's like, they barely know how to close, let alone hiring somebody else to try to close for them. So I, I'm always a big fan of the first hire being kind of that inside sales lead manager, the person that's going to kind of dig through all the leads in the CRM and tee you up for appointments. That's I'm a big fan of that for the first hire versus trying to go for acquisitions right out the gate. The, the hardest position to train is acquisitions. The easiest position to train is a lead manager. A lead manager is also doing an equal amount of work as an acquisition manager on the phones. So like they're on the phone all the time. So like going, like if, if you're like, who should I hire first for me to go from two deals a month to four, hire yourself a lead manager. Um, they're also a position that makes, dep depends like how you set them up or whatever, but my LMs make about 60 grand a year. Um, I, I pay people well because I want the best people and I want to retain them. Um, most people think an LM should make $48,000 a year. I want them to make 60 to 70 on my team because I just better rapport. They're here. They're camaraderie with the team. Like they, they do a lot better, but 100%, like if you're making your first hire and you're doing consistently, if you're doing two, three deals a month, no, I'm hire, this right now. hire yourself a lead manager and you'll go from two to three a month to four to five a month. Awesome. And, and uh, that one extra deal will pay for them. And then some. I've got a couple of questions that have rolled in that I'm going to hit you with. Yeah. Um, how many acquisitions? You said four, right? Yep. I got four right now, hiring a fifth, and then I will be um, promoting up uh, someone into a VP role who's overall my acquisitions. So it is, it's becoming a lot to manage two dispo guys, four acquisition guys, two lead managers. Um, there's also like, I used to be in a corporate world. You should really only ever have max like eight people reporting to you. And I'm at that and I'm like, I'm not losing my shit, but there's a lot to do. Uh, so hiring a VP will be my next role who's overall of my acquisition guys. Awesome. Um, Isaiah said, are you doing virtual appointments or are they going on appointments? So we used to be only in-person appointments. Um, what I've learned is that we were missing some deals um, because we couldn't get there for two days and someone would get there the day before us and close it. So if we could close it virtually, we do. If we need to go there in person to build rapport and engage with the seller and see the house, we do. Um, I'd love to actually, I guess, a metric I don't have is how many of ours are, are done virtually versus in person, um, but it's probably a 50 50 split if I were to take a guess. Awesome. Okay. Um, somebody else said, How much are you spending on marketing monthly and what are the best channels? Yeah. So, right now, um, last month when we hit 600K, our marketing budget did go up. We were, I think we were right around 85,000 in marketing last month. And our number one most consistent, we'll never shut it off, is direct mail. Um, direct mail has been the most consistent for our lead flow and deal flow. Um, we also do pay-per-click, pay-per-lead, um, you know, Facebook ads. Um, and then my AMs also prospect throughout the month. I do make it a requirement that they get two contracts a month from prospecting. Um, so that could be from other wholesalers, Jay being a deal with them and us moving it that uh, that way for them. Um, that can be uh, reaching out to agents. Uh, we've had some amazing deals come from pocket listings on agents. Um, one that we closed like uh, probably like a month ago, that deal alone, I think we made 55,000 on and it was a pocket listing from an agent. Um, but I'd say like our average pocket listing fee is around our average, which is about 18, 20,000. Um, and then let's see what other, uh, for sale by owner Zillow. Um, we get about one a month off for sale by owner. Um, and that's been consistent as well. 
We don't do any cold your texting, by the way. So oh, oh no, no sketchy I'm spammy. Super <laughs> no 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 sketchy spammy. Um I'm just if I hate getting cold calls and texted, I'm not doing it to other people. So even though people do get mad at mail coming in, I don't get mad if I get mail. So <laughs> it's just weird to have people get mad about mail. But um if I'm mad at getting text messages and cold calls from someone in the Philippines that barely speaks English. I'm not going to do that to sellers as well. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. And I do the same really thing. Good. So I, I do the same thing, like end user experience. How does this feel for that person? Is is that something I would want done to me or not? Correct. Um, so what's your current cost per deal off direct mail? I just, you did a reel on this the other day, but for anybody who didn't see it, what are you, what are you spending? Yeah, our current cost per um, deal on direct mail is right around four thousand uh, dollars a deal. Um, some months it'll be three thousand, some months it'll be five, but it flows right right at four thousand on average. I've got a question for you that didn't come into the chat, but I'm curious on your take on it. So, like four people in CCF, um, what do you think has enabled you guys to have like true net seven figure years? versus most people stuck at the, you know, half a million a year and below range. Processes, knowing, knowing how to underwrite a deal. And then not only that, but like taking the deal from like start to finish and building that rapport with the seller, but having a process of like that lead comes in, it gets, you find a situation. If they have a situation, it is passed off to the acquisitions. They know how to underwrite it. Um, I oversee a lot of the underwriting still with them. And then after underwriting, they make an offer. Um, and I, one of the big pieces that I think a lot of people can't do um, is actually negotiate um, and build the true rapport with a seller. Um, I've, I've had acquisition guys come in and everyone's first month on the phones is like god awful. Um, some are better than others, but like guys that came in on the first month um, which their pipelines not built up, but say they get like two or three deals in their first month are now doing six, seven, eight deals a month for us. Um, and it's knowing how to talk to a seller. Um, and there's a, an 80, 20 rule, uh, the Pareto theory. I'm sure everyone knows that, that theory out there. Um, but essentially you should be only talking on the phone 20% of the time. The seller should be talking 80%. Um, I, 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 I probably sound like more of a hard ass than I actually am, but I beat my guys up on like talking too much. And uh, one of my guys that was like, probably re the worst at it. Um, and and I was really bad at it too. Like he's, I'm a talker and I gave him this acronym. I was like, Hey, you need to learn the acronym wait. And he's like, wait. And I was like, it stands for something. I was like, what do you think it is? And he took a couple stabs at it. Didn't get it. I was like, it stands for why am I talking? And so I remember that like when I'm, talk with the seller or anyone in general, like I tell myself, I had wait. So only talk like when you need to prime more out of a seller and not just fill up the empty airspace, just to fill up the empty airspace. Um, if you can get sellers to talk 80% of the time and you 20% of the time, they will divulge so much information to you. It's unreal. Um, one of my guys on my team, Jake, is probably the best I've ever seen at it. He does it to me sometimes and I get pissed. I'm like, stop, like you're not closing me. But um, learning how to wait, learn like, why am I talking is is huge and get those sellers to open up to you um, is big. So that, and then underwriting a deal properly. Um, we get a lot of deals from other wholesalers that want us to move their deal for them. And underwriting the deal, I'm like, Where'd you get this ARV? And they're like, oh, like this this house ARV was sold for three hundred. I'm like, but the one next door that's exactly the same sold for two forty. Don't ignore that. You know, like if that one next door sold for two forty, that is what every single buyer is going to look at or appraiser if I'm trying to buy it, and that has to make sense. So, don't cherry pick your comps on a property to try to drive your ARV up when you have really really good comps to use. Um, if you underwrite your deals properly and you stick to your number that you have to get that deal at, you will get it there eventually. We have a lot of deals that we lose to other companies and 
we and when we call them back we're like yeah we signed a contract because they're 30 grand higher than you it's like okay when when is your option period end? Like it ends in you know ten days, twenty, thirty days, whatever it is. We'll make a task up with them in half that time. So if it ends in ten days, we call them in five. Be like, hey, just want to see how it's going. Is a title open? Do they have their earnest money in? Um, what's going on? And I'd say about half the time they're like, oh, they. I think they're canceling the contract on us. I'm like, I told you they would. You know, like. But, you know, you know, Stephanie, I'm really glad uh, that, I, that I called you today and that gives us the opportunity. Like, why don't we come take a look at it when they've officially sent you the termination on it and we can make you an offer. We can stand behind on this. So underwriting a deal goes is, is why I think most people fail because they get a lot of properties under contract. and They terminate them because they can't sell them. Uh, but knowing how to underwrite a deal is probably the hardest um, next to negotiating. Um, and I've always said underwriting a deal isn't a science, it's an art. Um, it's very subjective. Um, but when you can use facts, you have to use them and you have to recognize those facts and stop going off your feelings. You can't just ignore the comp you didn't like. <laughs> just pretend it's not there. I love that. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that also happens on the dispo side. Well, like the dispo side, you'll have buyers call us and they'll ignore your really good comp and throw a shitty comp at you and you got to bring them back in and show them that really good comp of, you know, cookie cutter house. So you have to know on the dispo side on underwriting that deal of, Hey, hey Jack, like I see you're looking at this deal and you're, you're calling ARV 490. We're calling it 545 because well, one, ours has a pool two we're on a corner lot. That's twice the size. And three, that one that was at 499, whatever I said, they didn't fully, remodel that house either um so we've got to pull a bigger lot and if you were to do what our rehab budget suggests to get that arv i bet you get that arv all day yeah the other thing i think you guys have done really well is you've scaled your marketing to increase the deal flow like a lot of people i think do 2k a month in marketing and just hope one month they're going to get 20 deals like that just mm -hmm. something is going to go haywire with it. And I think you guys better than most from my standpoint have set the like, okay, if we want to do 300 deals this year and our typical cost per deal is this, we need to do this much in marketing. I think you guys have done really well with that too. Yeah. I was actually on a, a call with a buddy of mine, Jacob Klein. I met him through CCF and I was actually just showing him my model breakdown of how much you should spend on marketing per an acquisition rep in order to get like your revenue that you want. Um, and I think if anyone here is like at the point of hiring their first acquisition manager, you owe it to them to not spend two grand a month in marketing. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's life is, you know, relying on you and their paychecks. Like you need to spend enough in marketing to get them enough lead flow for them to put enough on their contract so that they can make their six figure salary and live comfortably and want to come back to work. Um, and do you mind, you mind sharing have? what that minimum is? Yeah, we spend 20 grand per an acquisition rep per month. A lot of you oh, guys don't spend 20 grand for yourself. <laughs> okay. And and that's a, that's a combination of mostly mail. Um, 70% 70, 70 of our deals come from mail. Um, and the other 30% are paper lead, our SEO, Facebook, um, stuff like that. So um, we always spend about $20,000 per rep is what it comes out to. And and they should be putting, by the way, we require acquisition reps. Just so you guys know, $125,000 a month is what each acquisition rep uh, is required to put into forecasted gross revenue into the pipeline. Um, so of that 125, if you have a 25% fallout rate, um, I'm not good at public math, but that's roughly 90,000 enclosed deals. If they're paid 10% of the deal, that's roughly a $9,000 check a month to them. 9,000 times 12, they're making six figures. And if we do your math, right, I'm spending 20 minus 90 minus their 10. There's still plenty of left, plenty of leftover. Do you know, and do you mind sharing, I guess? Last month, 600K in top line. What do you think your actual net out range will be on that after all the marketing, all the staff, all the overhead? Yep. So great question. And 
we as a wholesale company you should be sitting in or between a 30 to 50 percent profit margin if you're getting down into the 30 percent and the low 30s you probably have management in there like you have someone who's over all of your acquisition guys someone over your dispo um you're putting like our personal assistant is in there as well so we sit around a um a 38 percent profit margin on ours um so if if we make a hundred thousand dollars in a month um, which if we're only doing a hundred grand a month, we're in trouble. But if we're doing a hundred grand a month, we should be netting 38,000. So. Awesome. Very solid. That 100 K will net about 200, roughly 250. The thing I love though, like, I think I put this in the email I flicked out. I mean, that's what a lot of guys like goal is for a year. Yeah. And you guys are doing it monthly, but you're I also like spending nice. you what? <laughs> I like nice shit. <laughs> Same. <laughs> um, this is a good question from Zach, and this is probably more of a Terra question, but are you guys using Audantic, Dataflick, 8020, anything like that? Or are you guys pulling all the lists yourself and managing? Uh, Terra was supposed to be on this call and I would have deferred that to her, but that is definitely a Terra question. Um, okay. We have our swim lanes and honestly, I don't know. So Got it. Okay. Um, my understanding is she's managing it. Um, and CRM wise, what are you guys using? Recently, um, I, I've tried other systems. I actually left Resimply, went to Podio, spent, built out, was in it for 90 days. And I called Sherrod and begged him to take me back. <laughs> um, so I'm in who, who told you that was a bad idea? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I went back to Resimply. I've been back in there for, uh, probably almost two years now. Um, I'm also on Sherrod's, um, uh, I don't know what he exactly calls it. His An advisory to- council or whatever. Or, yeah. So like, there's some really cool stuff coming out in Resimply for, I'm sure most of you already use it. Um, if you don't, like there is, um, some good stuff coming in at that. Like I've, I've kind of helped steer Sherrod towards, um, well, I won't take all the credit. He had some of the ideas himself too, but there's some great stuff coming out in there. Um, and any CRM you use though, the best the best CRM is a CRM you use, first of all. Um, you got to use it right. It, it doesn't matter if you want to use Podio or Salesforce or whatever, you, or a spreadsheet, but like you have to use it and use it consistently and keep it clean and it'll it'll work for you. But I, I do stand behind Resimply. simply. Um, and I don't even have an affiliate link and I talk about it all the time to people. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Um, somebody had asked about like the data management side and I'm pretty sure Tara, as well as I know myself, all of our stuff we're doing inside of Resimply's list stacker feature. Um, it's, it's pretty idiot proof. Like, uh, they have some great training resources and stuff on it, but that's where I manage all of our return to senders, all of our responders, if you guys are currently just ripping data from prop stream deal machine, something and mailing it, you're probably lighting 20 to 30% of your budget on fire. Um, I was uploading raw lists from prop stream last night and on average deal machine was weeding out like 10 to 20% as just, or excuse me, resimply was weeding out 10 to 20% as invalid, incomplete, etc. cetera. Um, so make sure you are taking people off the list, removing people that have already responded. That way you're not just wasting your marketing budget, especially as you get to scale. I think that that gets super important. Yeah. And and we do use Resimply for our list stacking as well. Um, and one of the features that will be coming in Resimply is that it it pulls essentially like if you go on PropStream, you can see like what, re, like what other properties a seller owns. Like linked. Yeah. So that's when you come and re simply of like, where like, say someone calls in, they're like, Hey, like I've ran in there. I'm not interested in selling that property. Well, instantly you'll be able to see like Margaret has 17 other properties. Well, Margaret, I see here, you have quite a few other properties that show in our system. What about any of those? Um, that's something that's not there. That will be a huge benefit to your, your acquisitions guys or, or lead managers. So on the marketing angle too, guys, um, this, this doesn't serve me as the owner of ballpoint. Uh, make sure you remove duplicates. So if you pull a list and one guy has 17 properties, you blow all credibility if you send homie 17 pieces of mail in a month. So yeah. just making sure you're doing that. We've done it. And 
it'll happen. So, yeah. Now this is a, uh, these are all lessons we've learned the expensive way that we're sharing. So you don't have yeah. to pay for them. Yeah. Um, Levi had a good question. How do you determine whether you're going to keep something, flip it or wholesale it? Um, so I've actually gotten a lot more pickier on what I'm keeping. Um, I have some shit box rentals that like, I'm not proud that they're in my portfolio. Cause they're just like, I wouldn't call them roach houses, but like they're, they're rough. Um, and they're as fixed up as they're going to be without like going and blowing a hundred grand on these places. Um, but for us now, if we're keeping a single family rental, um, they're essentially 1986 or newer, um, for us now. Um, and we are doing commercial as well. Um, this year we bought two large, I say large commercial properties. Um, we're, we're aiming more towards holding on a commercial. Um, I have a calculator I use. I actually was tweaking it the other day. I have no problem sharing. I was actually going to put it on my Instagram, like throw it out there for free for anyone. Um, but essentially you plug in it's nine or 10 numbers. Um, it is, what is the, um, per, no, what is the contract price you got the property at? What is the assignment fee on it? What is the ARV as a full flip, a quick flip, a whole tail, meaning you don't do any work to it? And what work and what is the ARV if it was a rental, which is probably like a quick flip, might be a full flip. Um, and you plug in like those nine numbers, um, and it literally spits out like what exit strategy is best for us. And you can kind of just compare them like, oh, if we wholesale it, we make 30. If I wholesale it, I make 42. If I decide to fully flip this house, I'll make 87. Um, so I kind of rely, not kind of, I rely on that spreadsheet I have that uh, kicks all that out. And shout out to Jason Lee. I actually got that from him and I built off of it. Um, but that was Jason Lee's spreadsheet that he shared with me originally. Awesome. Yeah. Jason Lee and Aaron Beal are partners in San Antonio. Yeah. I saw him on there. He asked a question too, about like a 38% profit margin. Um, did that include owner pay? Um, that uh, does include, actually that does not include owner pay. That is just straight on the business. And then we pay ourselves um, out of the business, but that 38% does not include owner pay. Um, I'm going to have Justin throw a link to a next deal podcast that he did with Tara, Billy's wife, all about the data management. She's pulling all the lists, managing all of it inside Resimply. So if you guys want insight into that, um, she's way more detail oriented than I am. So I highly recommend you guys check out that. Justin will throw it in the uh, down in the chat for you guys. Um, yeah, and if good, wonder Tara's but, not just the marketing lady. She's also my boss. So... <laughs> <laughs> and wife, <laughs> and, wife. And, and and I call her HR because I'm I'm a walking HR violation. So she's HR. She also made. <laughs> I, I can I can vouch for that. Um, Casey Tavault said, "What's the biggest struggle right now in the company?" The biggest struggle right now in the company, to me, is just actually it's finding good people um, to work. Um, I do have a great team. Like every person on my team is awesome. Um, I've I've had to let people go, not in the past year, but like everyone in my office has been here a year and I have no turnover. Um, but I also hire very slow and I fire very fast. I've fired people on week two and three um, and I've taken months to hire people. So the biggest struggle though is finding the right people. Um, if you're going to look for... A lead manager doesn't need a ton of real estate experience, um, but an acquisition rep, if you can find someone that at least has the knowledge of comping a property and some sales experience, maybe they were in uh, car sales or mortgage sales or insurance sales, whatever, as long as they have some sales experience in them and the ability to underwrite deals, those are the people you should be finding. And those are not as easy as you think they would be to find. Yeah. I mean, you guys are paying way better than most. Like I die a little inside when I see people in CCF that are doing two or three K a month in marketing, they want to hire an acquisitions person that's commission only. Like yeah. you're, you're not going to get the medical device sales rep killer that you're looking for. That's going to pay dividends. And if you, do happen to land that person, they're going to quit with just the lead flow. They're just, it's, it's not going to be worth it for them. So 
Exactly. Um, good question here. Best way to build the buyer's list to offload deals? Um, best way to build a buyer's list is honestly, and I, I don't even like that I'm saying this, but Facebook groups, like there's legit buyers in Facebook groups. Um, I'm in there. Sell, yeah, we sell a lot through Facebook, um, getting new buyers, finding them there. Um, also, I've traded lists uh, with people. Um, that's how we've gotten it to 80,000. You know, I started with zero. Obviously, I skipped trace my own stuff. I built a list of like 200. I took that list, I traded it to 500, then 500, 1,000, and 1,000 to two. And then it just has, has climbed up from there. Um, I don't really trade the list much anymore because you also pay on how many emails you send. So, like, my constant contact bill a month is a couple grand. Um, and it just doesn't need to get any bigger. Um, once you have a dispo team, they should actually be skip tracing the LLCs in that area that own houses or have flipped houses in that area and calling those buyers to sell that deal um, and posting on Facebook. We sent out the email, like I said, more for brand recognition. Um, like I made a post this morning looking for an acquisition rep and like three people commented on there like, yeah, like Billy's a real deal. Like they, they send out deals and they're real deals. I get like 10 emails a day from them. Um, so like the email is really a lot of brand recognition. We do sell through it. I, I'm not gonna tell you, we don't sell deals through the email blast. We do. Um, but a lot of your best buyers are going to come from relationship as well. I have five buyers that probably each buy two from us a month. So once you find good buyers, you know what their buy box is and you know their area, it's a phone call. Like I sold one that's going to make us 45,000 yesterday um, by simply just calling Brad. Like, okay, hey, Brad, got this one over in Van I'll see and you want it. And he's like, I'll swing by, take a look. He was there, called me, I was there and bought it. And that is a lot easier than even building the marketing campaign for that email. So um, Ryan, I learned this from you and I used to think it was stupid. You used to say like, I'd rather have like a list of 20 really good buyers than a list of 80,000 and 100%. I'd rather have 20 phone numbers of really good buyers on my phone than a list of 80,000. So go meet 20 really good buyers and you'll sell your deal. And if you have a deal, it will sell. And if you can't sell it to your 20 buyers, post it on Facebook, uh, work buyers through there, you'll find a buyer for it. If you have a deal, it will sell. That's that's easy. Yeah. Um, on that note, so a uh, question came in on the commercial property stuff. So you guys had two whale deals that were on the self storage side. I think one was at 340 K was the wholesale fee. 344. Uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. $344,000 on a single deal. That's the CCF record. And then the other one you guys kept and it spits out what in cash flow now? Um, insurance has killed us the past year and a half. We, we okay. cash flow on that now about five to 6,000 a month that you used to be about eight to nine thousand a month um but on that deal we added to our network uh, about 1.2 million by buying that deal and those came off of 780 pieces of ballpoint or 781 yeah. i think <laughs> just yeah. just absurd like we tell the people in ccf do the residential stuff but like throw out the lures on the commercial stuff it's it's relatively insignificant cost wise um our recommendation, Andrew is who asked that on the list. So we pull all of that data from Reonomy. Um, mm -hmm. And you just want to go after whatever you're looking for. So if you're looking for mobile home parks, pull the list. If you're looking for industrial, self-storage, apartment complexes, like you name it, you can rip it in there. Um, yeah. I'm personally more interested in self-storage and the industrial just because I, I used to have 150 units and I didn't enjoy it. So Totally. Uh, Casey's other question, what does your meeting schedule look like with your guys? Yeah. So every single more well, Mondays, we have like our all team meeting. Um, and something we do with our team is we go over like personal goals and, um, uh, Tara, it's called like our development series or growth series. Um, but we help our employees like hit their own personal goals. So it could be weight loss. That could be savings. That could be, uh, one of our guys is trying to run a marathon, um, so we, we do that with them. That's our Monday morning meeting and something fun to do with your team, by the way, is everyone agrees that they pick their one goal for the month. 
Um, and essentially if they miss their goal, um, a hundred dollars goes in the pot and the people that did hit their goal get to have their name in the hat and, uh, draw out of the hat. And they, if they, their name is drawn, they get the money from all the people that didn't hit their goal. Um, so Monday morning, and we were doing that, uh, if you miss your goal, you had to donate it to something that was like against your standards. Um, so like mine, like if I had lost mine, I had to donate a hundred bucks to like the Biden campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hit my goal in case anyone's wondering. Um, and then, uh, like another, I won't get into them. There's a whole bunch of them, but, um, so that, that's I've, what we do. I've done that with accountability partners. Like, all right, if I'm not yeah. in the gym, I've got to give a thousand dollars to something I just hate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that keeps the team motivated. Um, but we have our all team call Monday morning. Um, we go over wins, goals, um, win that they had from the week before, uh, update on their goals, how they're doing. Then we have, um, we go into just like updates for the week. Like, Hey, like, um, instead of us like buying like all the same shirt and get embroidered for everyone, we give our employees a stipend hundred bucks, go buy two, three polos that you like fit you well, and we'll get them embroidered for you. Um, so we just go over like updates and then every day of the week we do, on the acquisition side and the dis dispo side, two different meetings, um, a, a, a deal review. Um, so for the acquisitions, it's what are your hottest leads and how can we as a team get you closer to closing that deal? And that's done every single day. And on the dispo side, it's looking at the board. What do we have to sell? There's We usually float around you know, from 12 to 15 properties to sell at a time. Where are we at with them? What are some... Hangups you're getting with buyers. Uh, what's the feedback you're getting? Do we have to go for price reduction if we have to? By the way, only do a price reduction if you have to. Don't be a piece of shit and go get price reductions because you couldn't negotiate the deal originally. Um, that's something I stand behind. I know so many people that price drop just to take their margin from twenty to thirty, and that's dirty. Um, so we have the the lead reviews, um, and then we also do call reviews. Um, Right now, I'm doing it once a week because of the time I have, but we will be adding in, um, once my VP is promoted up, he will be doing call reviews probably at least twice a week. And I think a ton of value comes from that. Of you just you hear someone's call that was totally botched with the seller or they didn't pick up on something the seller said that they should have to get that deal. Um, and then I have a call with my TC once a week to go over all the deals that she has on the board. Uh, we just look at stuff with title issues basically. Um, and I help guide her on what should, what we should be doing as well, or what she could be doing to help get those closer to the closing table. Awesome. Um, Isaiah said, what are the three changes you made to go from one deal a month to three to four? I quit my W2. Uh, <laughs> um, the changes I made to go from one deal to three or four a month. Um, well, first it revolves around marketing. If you don't have leads, you can't get deals, period. Um, and so the amount of marketing you do will result in the amount of deals you can get. Um, and really practice makes perfect. You have to underwrite deals over and over and over again to get good at underwriting them and selling them and seeing them and talking to sellers. Um, so really it's just repetitions um, to go. I wouldn't, and I would not advise anyone to try to go from three deals a month right now or one deal a month right now to 15. You you have to crawl before you can walk. So like my goal um, by the end of the year is that we're contracting uh, 50 properties a month. In order to do that, like I can't go from where we're at now doing uh, 28 a month to 50. I have to go from 28, add another acquisition guy, go to 35, add another acquisition guy, go to 42 add another acquisition guy, then get to 50. Um, you have to, you have to, and every time you add someone, you'll figure out that you have processes that don't work and you have to take those, tweak them and correct them to then keep moving forward. Yeah, that's, that's stellar. And, and something that I want to point out, cause I, I don't want people to be like, oh, okay, cool. So I just need to go drop 12 to 16 K a month on marketing. You probably do need to do more marketing than you're doing, but you also need to be doing the other revenue generating stuff. So yep. looking at for rents, looking at for sale by owners, looking at what's on market. This doesn't benefit me at all as somebody that would sell you mail or CCF. Um, but like 
real talk, if your goal is a deal a month, you probably don't need CCF or even ballpoint at that point. If you're going to just work your ass off, you can yep. probably find a deal a month. I mean, shoot, Billy's employees are responsible for two a month. So two, two things there to this topic. One is I tell people that if you're looking to do one deal a month, don't get into wholesaling. It's easier for you to flip one house a quarter and make the same amount of money. Um, if you're wanting to get into wholesaling, you, you should have a goal to at least get to three a month. That's when it makes sense. Um, and then I forgot what number two was, but that was number one. <laughs> number one was solid. Um, all right. Let's see. Amanda, good question. Do buyers ever care how much you're making on the property if it's a hefty amount? Yes and no. Um, I, I know people that are like, oh, I only assign everything. Like the buyers don't care. Um, I've I've had buyers not care and I've had their lender blow the deal the day of closing because they got the HUD and they saw I was making 60000 Um, Our rule of thumb, if it's over 20000 we double close it. And like, there's like no questions asked unless it's one buyer I have, have being Brad. Um, if it's like, he knows like what I make on deals and he truly doesn't care. And I know his lender doesn't care because um, it's a private lender and his private lender doesn't even look at the HUD. Um, but other than that, anything over 20 K we double close. Yeah, that's solid. We, um, our threshold used to be 10. We've bumped it up because we were just double closing stuff. We didn't need to close. As far as I'm concerned, if somebody's willing to blow a relationship and not honor their word, cause I'm making 15 K probably not somebody I want to do business with anyway. Yeah. And it's good to get to the, and you guys will get there eventually to the position where you could flex on your buyers. Like I had a buyer last week that was, uh, annoyed with how much we were making. And it was 20 grand. Um, and I was almost like, well, I'll just take your five grand. I'll close it myself. I'll list it on market then. And he's like, you can't close this. I'm like, bro, I'll send you my bank account. I'll fucking close this. <laughs> and he closed, you know? So even that 20 K, like, I feel like that's walking the line on the amount. Um, but in the, and you should find like what your market is. So like California, if you're wholesaling in San Diego, like it might be fine to have that be a 30 K mark. Uh, but DFW, I, I find that the sweet spot is 20K where I don't have lenders care too much. Yeah. Uh, good question from Levi. Have you thought about just going national? Why stay local first casting a wide net? Absolutely. Um, I've pulled data on that. And I was I was kind of wondering why. Uh, I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, I, maybe I shouldn't expand in Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Houston, San Antonio, wherever. Like, should I expand out from where I'm at now? And I pulled data on how many cash transactions take place in DFW a year that are sold to investors, meaning they're sold to an LLC or to someone who doesn't live at that mailing address. And it was 19,000 transactions a year. Bro, my business is a rounding error. I am nothing on that. So um, yeah. I don't see the need to expand outside of my region. Um, we know... We know every block, every street, every city, what buyers buy it. And we have our buyers here until I'm doing half of those 19,000 deals a year. I don't see the need to go anywhere else unless I personally want to buy somewhere else. And arguably, man, like I know a lot of guys that are talking about national or pushing national or even some guys that own like the national brands that rank in most cities. Most mm -hmm. of them aren't doing the deal flow or netting nearly as much as what Billy's making. I mean, I'm a big, like, I won't name names, but I'll share lessons. And I know one of those guys that has one of the national brands and I was in a mastermind with him and he's like, we make no money. Oh, you know, so yeah. it it's a lot easier if you're within driving distance versus, you know, not right. You can't go run an appointment if that's what it requires to get the deal closed. If you're three States over, unless you're going to hop in the car or take a flight. Right. Yeah. And most guys that are running big national companies have a more than 50% fallout rate. And that's just, that's why so many people want to regulate wholesaling It's because we don't commit to what we were supposed to do because of big national companies or even local guys that just don't know how to underwrite a deal and get it under contract for the right price. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do this one more and then I'll wrap. I'm going to hard cut at uh, one thirty CST time because I want to respect Billy's time and I have another call. Um, Drake said that business is basically a proverbial slinky of deal flow, high months, low months with kind of a lacking inconsistency. 
He said, once you got the increase in lead flow, what was your biggest like aha to turn the leads into conversions? The biggest aha to turn leads into conversions. Um, I want to make sure I give like the good right answer on that. And to me, like the biggest thing turned leads into conversions and to stay consistent is to market consistent so that you have that consistent lead flow. Um, so like say say your marketing budget and you're running solo is is four thousand a month. Don't drop four grand on April first and then not have another four grand to spend until May first. You're gonna be super busy April fifth through the twelfth and then not busy the rest of the month. Take that four thousand dollars and drop a thousand dollars of it a week, and do that every single week very consistently, and you'll see that your deals flow consistently. Um, I see people like, "Oh, I spent twenty five thousand two months ago, and I don't have anything." I'm like, well, what did you spend this month? They're like, "Nothing." And I'm like, "You should have spent twelve last month. Work those leads really, really good." Because there's also a a thing that like your acquisition guys or you could have too many leads where you're cherry picking and not working your leads uh, hard enough. Um, to where you're leaving money on the table. Um, and as a number to that, each acquisition rep should have inbound about 75 leads a month. Um, that doesn't mean they're talking to them, but like that's how many leads should be coming in. And of those 75, they'll get five contracts. Cool. So what's uh, homeschooled? So I'm not going to be able to do that math in my head, but uh, what's what's five deals on 75 leads? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. I'm not good at public math six. either. So 7% effectively of raw lead into closed deals. Sounds about right. Oh, so awesome. That was my post uh, I made yesterday. It's, it's, a you know, if 20 leads come in, seven of them are taking off your list. Seven of them are tire kickers. Six of them are legitimate leads. Four of those you're able to get an appointment with. You make an offer on four of those, you get one contract. Uh, Billy, thank you very much, man, for hopping on, hanging out, being transparent. Um, I think it's refreshing compared to a lot of the stuff we see on social media, people pretending they're doing 30 deals a month versus actually doing it and what marketing budget and team level looks like. Thanks for hopping on, man. Absolutely, guys. Appreciate everyone. Talk to you soon. See y'all. Bye.